Hi everyone. Oh. Hi. <laughs> Hi Wayne. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Constantine, and I'm gonna talk to you about real time rec. But first, I want to thank Engineered. Uh, they're sponsoring my trip here, and yeah, really grateful for that. Otherwise, I couldn't be here and talk to you guys. Yeah, bit about me. Um, I'm on GitHub and on Twitter, and I have a blog, like probably most of you have. And uh, back in Germany, where I'm originally from, I'm a student as, at the Hassel Plattner Institute of IT Systems Engineering, which is in Potsdam, close to Berlin. In case you ever want to visit, I'd be happy to show you around. Um, in my free time, I'm also maintaining Sinatra. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's yeah, quite popular. Um, I'm also maintaining a fork or a clone called Almost Sinatra, which is probably going to be more popular than Sinatra really soon, because it's, it's only eight lines. <laughs> and I recently also, no, I'm also working on a book about Sinatra, which is supposed to land next month if I'll continue writing in time. Uh, so if you want to learn more about Sinatra, please get that book. It's at O'Reilly, Sinatra Up and Running. And I'm also a member of the REC core team. I'm going to talk a bit more about what REC is, in case you're not fully aware of that. And I'm currently doing an internship in Portland, also sponsored by Engineered working full-time on Rubinius, an alternative Ruby implementation in case you haven't heard of that. <laughs> OK, this talk is about breaking the laws of REC. But why do we want to break the laws of REC? So back in the day, the web worked like this. You put in an URL. You request a page, you get a response back from the site, and your fancy web browser displays it. And, but that's pretty boring. So along came Ajax, doing all those fancy requests you don't really notice, getting data while you're on the page, and so on. But Ajax is really the client requesting data from the server, but in some cases, you want just to have the server push out data to the client. And people came up with something, something called a comet, which basically is AJAX, but this polling to the server to get messages from the server. But this isn't what I mean when I talk about it real time. Real time is um, streaming from the server to the client and pushing data at any time you feel like that. The basic idea is to decide what to send while streaming, not up front. And this is useful for uh, streaming APIs, as Twitter does. I don't know if you've written a Twitter client. You've probably come across that. Uh, or server send events. I'll go into detail about that in a, in a bit. Or you've probably all have heard about WebSockets, which is basically this is basically the foundations for implementing WebSockets over REC. But I'll start with the demo. You've all probably seen this prompt before. Can calculate stuff or write our code. So this is basically a clone of IRB. And the sweet thing is it's running in my web browser. And it's also non-blocking. So yes. And which is really fancy is it's sending the data to the server, the, the string to evaluate. And then the server just yeah, does an eval and returns the results to the client using server send events which is insecure, but well, for a demo, it's fine. But the real fun thing is when I fire up a second browser, this could be another on another machine, right? So 
Let me just do that. And when I run some code here, it's actually sent out to both both clients or all clients if you if you'd connect to that port. I have a firewall on, so don't even try. <laughs> and yeah. This is basically what I'm talking about when I'm talking about real-time web. And I'm gonna show you how to do this. But first, let's make sure you all we're all on the same page. You all understand how Rack is working internally. Rack is basically a Ruby to HTTP to Ruby bridge. So it's a, a mainly a specification how to translate HTTP requests into Ruby objects and then um, translate that back into HTTP responses. And it's also a middleware API. And it's the foundation for basically every Ruby web framework library out there, including Rails, Sinatra, and so on. And the basic structure is this. You have the HTTP client, which is normally your browser, could be anything else, which is talking to a thing we call the Rack Handler, which is basically your web server, like Thin or Mongrel or Passenger or whatever. And this handler is the one doing the translation from and to HTTP, and then using the Rack protocol to talk to any middleware and then the so-called endpoint. So what you usually do when you're writing your Rails application or your Sinatra application is you define the endpoint and then Sinatra and Rails set up some middleware in front of that for all the routing and filtering and whatnot. And the handler is talking to that. So a basic Rack application, if you're not using any framework, looks like this. It's, it's, it can be a proc that takes uh, an env hash, which is basically a hash of the past HTTP headers and a bit more of environment information. And then it has to return an array with three elements. The first one is the status code. The second one is a hash of the, of the headers. And the last one is an object that loops through th strings that will be sent to the client. So, but it doesn't have to be a, a proc. It can actually be any object that responds to call and takes an and fetch, or you know, just this line. I'm going to use a bit of Sinatra during my talk just to cut down the boilerplate, but Sinatra really embraces Rack and you could just return the Rack response in here. But so you can see what I'm talking about, I will cut out some of the Rack code by that. And what the handler is doing now is something like this. It's actually parsing the HTTP response into an end hash, and then it calls call on that. And after that, it sends out the headers, and then calls each on the body object, and after that, closes the connection. This is basically the code you'll find in about any rack handler out there. And yeah, before I talk about streaming, Let's take a look at middleware. This is a stupid middleware that will take the body of um, your Rack endpoint, your Rails application, or whatever, and turn everything into uppercase. I mean, who doesn't want that, right? So what it does is actually sto stores the endpoint, or the next middleware in the middleware chain, because you could use more than one middleware, obviously. And then when it gets a call call, it will send that call to, to the application. Of course, it could uh, modify the end hash or keep a list of applications or whatever to do other nice things. But that really doesn't matter for streaming. And then it calls each on the body object. And, and yeah, uppercases everything and returns that. I'm not using map in here, because that would violate the rec specification, since it's not guaranteed that the body object responds to map. OK. And this is how you would set that up. You would write a config.ru file. Uh, your rec, if you have a rec application, it's usually there already. Or you could use some rec or uh, some Rails interface to set a middleware. Yeah. And what the server is doing is, instead of this line, which we had in the, in the 
rack handler code I showed you, um, it's doing this. It's calling new on the middleware, passing the endpoint to it, and then calls call on that one. Okay. If you have any questions about that, please ask now. I want to make sure we're all on the same page. So I don't. I gave this talk at Scottish RubyConf, and people said I lost them like halfway in. Okay. So let's talk about streaming. As I said already, the body object has to respond to each. And apart from that, it can be basically anything. So we can use that to implement some streaming. This simple application would um, send, the, uh, send the current time 20 times and always waits one second in between sending that out. Um, which you could see if you would yeah, use the browser or just use curl. It's coming in bit for bit with one second delays. And I'm using Sinatra again. Fancy, right? Um, OK. But let's do something more fancy with that. Let's do a messaging service where you have a list of clients, like in my um, IRB example, and can send data out to them. So this is the interface we would like to have. We would like to keep a list of, of subscribers. And then for everyone opening a connection to the slash, there should, the connection should be kept open. And whenever you post to the application, um, it should send a message to it. So yeah, adding the subscriber, sending the messages down here. And how would we implement that with just each? Well, we could do something like this. Um, the subscriber obviously has to wait somehow for new messages to come in. We do that with a sleep, which blocks the current thread. And then whenever we send out data, we just wake up that thread, which we stored when each was called, and, and send out the data. This works fine on some servers, but there are some issues with that. Mainly, it blocks the current thread with the sleep, which um, is an issue if you don't have a, a separate thread for every request, which you do, usually don't. If you have a, like, a server using a thread pool, you, um, it will be able to handle as many requests simultaneously as the size of your thread pool is which is typical for some service. Um, it does not work well with some middleware. Imagine we take that application and chain the uppercase middleware in front of it. That wouldn't work, because the uppercase middleware is calling each on that, and, and it waits until each finishes, until it hands the result on to the handler. So we would never see any result. And it does not work well, or not at all, with evented servers like Thin Goliath app or rainbows. So yeah, let's see what we can do about that. My presentation is actually running in thin, so it has to work somehow. The solution is to do evented streaming, where we don't have a thread per request. Um, but what is evented? Evented in this case means we have an event loop, which is usually run by event machine. App is the only server not using event machine for this. And this is basically a huge while true loop, which on, on every loop through, it checks for registered callbacks or um, where a callback is triggered whenever, whenever data comes in or a new connection comes in. And it sends out data that is uh, registered for sending out. And then it, you, know, you basically do all the stuff in the callbacks and register no, new callbacks and so on. So, that's web scale, yeah? And if you take this non-evented uh, application, um, you ba probably every one of you sees that it will wait 10 seconds. And only after that, it will fire the request to Redis. And if you would th do that with event machine, it would look something like this. You would start the event loop with event machine run. And you can add a timer to trigger this callback 
after 10 seconds, and you can add another, another callback to trigger this code whenever Redis responds, and then the, the event loop will take care of triggering that in the right moment. So um, the Redis request is completely independent from the, um, from the timer. And this is what all the evented servers are basically using internally to handle a huge amount of connections. And um, yeah, so putting that into our application, um, we can use a nifty trick called the async callback, where we basically send out our rec response, which is back here, you know, the status code, the headers, and the body, uh, whenever the timer callback is fired. And then we have to do some magic down there to tell the rec handler that we are going to trigger the response later, and it, it should just go on with the event loop without caring about us for now. And there are two ways to do that. The first one is to use throw, which was discussed shortly in the exception talk yesterday by Avi. Yeah. And, and this basically skips all the middleware, goes right through the, to the uh, rec handler, which does a catch throw somewhere, and uh, catch async somewhere and then just keeps on doing whatever it's doing. Or you could alternatively return a status code of minus one, which is usually nicer because you don't use throw, which will unroll the stack, and um, your middleware will handle that easier. But if you're running in development mode, REC will complain about this being an invalid status code. So, but what is the handler doing? No, I'm sorry. Um, and there's also a nice library called Async Sinatra, which adds for all the get post methods and so on an async version where you don't have to care about telling the, the rec handler to do this asynchronously. And yeah, of course, instead of a timer, this could also be a request uh, to Redis or whatever. Redis isn't that good an example because Redis is pretty fast, but you could like query Google and it will take a couple of time and you want to go on to other stuff while, while that's happening. And the rec handler is some, doing something like this. Again, it's parsing the request, and then it sets up the asynchronous callback where it basically does all the stuff it would usually be doing just after the request. It sends out the the headers and then um, uses each again to send out the data. I use send data here because it's an event machine method. And then it closes the connection. And, and then it stores the callback in the NFash so the application can access it. And yeah, after that it's just going on to call the, the, N, uh, the, the, the application. And, checks the status code. If it's minus one, it will skip the callback for now. Otherwise, it will just call the callback and send out the data. And, and the catch async is here to allow the app leaving it with throw, which is basically behaving like an exception. OK, so far so good. But that's postponing. That's sending at some later point. That's not really streaming. Of course, we could do now do our each streaming where we're plugging, blocking the thread again, but then no other request would be dealt with in, during that time since uh, event machine is basically single threaded. So there's a nifty trick to use event machine deferrable or anything that behaves like event machine deferrable, which all the evented servers implement. Um, a deferrable is basically a three-state state machine, which has the states of not done yet, succeeded, and failed. And you can turn anything into a deferrable by just including event machine deferrable 
and then this adds a callback method that will be triggered whenever the the um, deferrable succeeds and an airbag method that will be triggered whenever the deferrable fails. And then you have a succeed method and similarly you do have a, a fail method on that object. And um, what it basically does is uh, if it's a deferrable, um, it will not close the connection until the deferrable fails or succeeds. So this code you've seen previously setting up the callback, it's changed to this code where we check if it has a callback method. Actually, the handler checks also if it has a airbag method, but I just wanted to save some code here. And then it closes the connection whenever one of those is triggered. And if it's not a deferrable, it just closes the connection right away. And it's still using each up here. Um, so what we have to do is to get to send the data whenever we want, like we would like to. Okay, let's try to make this example from I showed you previously make that evented so it runs so thin. Uh, this is the changed API. Uh, we are using a get now to have an asynchronous request and the the return value no longer matters since we're going to send out the, the response later on. Okay, but this is our new subscribe object. It's less code even. So the trick here really is to, when each is called, not to yield that block to that block, but instead store that block for later on. So whenever we call that, uh, the rec handler will actually call send data. And of course we have to include the deferrable to set up the callback methods. And then all we have to do is whenever we want to send data is trigger that callback. And if we want to close the connection later on, okay, yeah, I have to code again, sorry. If we close the connection later on, we just call succeed on that. Um, yeah, so my simple API is if you do a delete request, close all the connections. And um, that's basically the foundation for evented streaming. Now, you can use that to implement um, service and events, uh, which is a new standard for H from the uh, W3C. Um, and it's kind of a one-way WebSocket. So, Whenever you want to use WebSockets, but you use it only to send data from the server to the client, just do yourself a favor and go for uh, service and events instead. It's way easier on all the levels. Um, yeah, super simple. It, they are resumable. If the connection is lost, the web browser will automatically uh, open the connection again and knows where to continue in the stream and so on. It's a no-brainer. And the client can be implemented just in JS for browsers that don't support it with the full streaming support. This is possible, including for Internet Explorer 7, I think. And even if your client is using Internet Explorer 6 or whatever else, um, it degrades to polling, which is really nice, which is not that possible. If you want to run WebSockets, you have to include some Flash or uh, something else to get that working. And this is the uh, client API you can use in JavaScript. It's available on Firefox, Chrome, I, probably Safari, I don't know. But you can use a JavaScript implementation, as I said. And you basically set up a callback that is triggered um, whenever the server feels like sending data to you. And the stream from the server looks like this. First, the HTTP headers. So this is the real HTTP response you're getting from the server. And then this just stays open. And whenever the server feels like sending data, it's sending the data out, prefixed with data. And to, uh, to show that the um, message is over, it leaves a new line. And you can use that to have multi-line messages. Yes. And 
To ease resumability, you can also add an ID for tracking. And whenever the browser opens a request again, it tells you which was the, which the last ID was that it saw. So you can actually track what happened there and do whatever you want with that. And the ID doesn't have to be an integer. It can basically be any string. So it could be a checksum or anything, tweet ID, whatever. And this is the complete implementation. This is actually the code I'm using for the example for the demo I showed you, um, where it's basically the same as our subscriber with a more fancy, fancy send, since you know we have to split up the lines and, and then send up an ID if, if we added an ID. I'm using the, the line number. I'm checking line numbers, and I'm using that as an ID if the connection is lost to resume at the right point. And then at last, there's WebSockets, which is kind of a two-way event source. Um, this is the client interface. You think, uh, you think probably, oh, I've seen that. Yeah, that's correct. It's basically the same interface as the e event source interface. With one exception, it also has a send method where you can send back methods, uh, messages. Now, the thing is, this is way harder to, to implement in REC. So I'm just showing you this little gem. There are a few others out there. This is, I think, the most popular. It's called Event Machine WebSockets, where you start a separate server on the port. And then you basically have exactly the same interface you have on the client also on the server. And there are some issues with, with WebSockets. So this is why I said. If, if you're just sending to the client, go for, go for server sent events. The client needs patching. Not every browser supports that, and you have to use Flash or something to, to add that. But also, the server needs patching. REC does not support sending data from the client later on while you're already streaming data back to the client. So you basically have to patch REC. There are projects out there doing this. But it's not possible with vanilla rec. And the proxies need patching. HA proxy used to have huge issues due to there being a protocol upgrade, because basically it's not part of the HTTP specification that you can send data to the server after the server started sending data. And as I said, rec needs patching. And the last thing I want to mention is there is this new speedy protocol which wraps HTTP S. It's by Google, and it also it opens one SSL connection for um, for a multiple requests, and that SSL connection can also be used to send back data to the client at any time. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Thanks. My slides are up on GitHub. <laughs> <laughs>